Hello, hello everybody. Um, I think I'm now live. Welcome to this uh, Tuesday night live portrait painting demo. And I will, um, don't see if there's a couple people already here. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the work. Um, need to find the right brush first. Okay, and what I usually do is I start by measuring um, this photo. This is a photo of uh, someone I, who is one of my followers on Instagram. We've been putting up um, a series of four different photos to put up for a vote and see um, what photos people want me to paint. Um, this one came in um, second place, so this is the um, second week after that last, um, that last vote that I had. And so I, I tend to do the, first, the top two um, choices to do one week and then the next, and then I'll put up another um, group for a vote. If, um, okay, see so you have one person there. That's, um, whoever's uh, signed in, can you let me know um, whether you're able to hear me okay? Because I've had some problems in the past with the sound or the, the sound volume. I can always talk, try to talk louder, um, but there's not too much I can do about um, sound quality. It's a little hard to do. Um, which rem you just reminded me, whoever um, is out there, that I have to be um, charging my phone at the same time. So I'm going to go ahead and um, plug the um, cable in. Sorry for the balancing around when I do that. Okay, let's get that back into place. Okay. Great. All right. So continue the work. Now it's charging. And I will keep on going. So I'm just measuring off uh, landmarks. Oops, I drew that eye and I didn't even measure from the top, which it's not a good idea. But luckily it is spot on. That's fortunate. Last week I did, I drew in most of the face only to realize I had it too far over and just then ended up redrawing and painting over my first attempt. So what I'm, what I do have here is that um, the panel that I'm painting is the same size as the photo that I have in Photoshop. So what I can do is just uh, measure one to one. Um, it's uh, what's called site size when something is this, your painting is visually the same size as uh, the the painting itself. So you can. What's nice about that is you can just um, look at what it is in your view. I do have it turned a little bit away from me so that it looks more square in the camera. So in that respect, it's not perfectly a site size painting. Um, but this is the method that a lot of painters would use. Uh, 19th century realists started um, painting this way and from the, from the um, Paris uh, Ecoles, from the um, Paris schools of painting. They would do live um, site size paintings of uh, sculptures, usually um, bus heads. Um, and do highly realistic um, value drawings and paintings from, from those as a way of training. But then also do that in terms of the models. They would, um, they would uh, s put the models, in a sense, uh, side by side with the canvas, and then they would stand back and um, until they would um, see or be able to see uh, what they've painted in relationship to to the the model and then make adjust slowly make adjustments so that they both matched visually and um, together so they could look at one kind of in a way toggling from side to side so the way you might have a photo in an app and then look at your painting at the same size and be able to toggle back and forth between the two and um, and then that way, 
um, you can see very quickly where the painting or the drawing is um, varies from the original. Okay, don't have any paint on that brush. I'm going to switch brushes because this one is longer and then I can measure and paint at the same time. Okay. So I'm curious to know uh, who's joined so far, where you're, who you are, where you're um, viewing from. I have some uh, subscribers that are from Australia, some that are from across the United States. I have a few um, across Europe and the Middle East. And it's a little harder for those people to tune in because it, of course um, it gets to be pretty late at night. I have one faithful uh, subscriber follower um, that is from Sweden. And so I tried to do a, well, I did do a live uh, video on Saturday um, of, um, of a model named Michael. He looked a little bit like a lost boy with all of, um, his makeup on. But anyway, I ended up doing that at one in the afternoon. I tried to get, um, get to it earlier, but it took me longer um, to do all my errands, uh, get all my errands done before I could start painting. So, but then that ended up being um, early evening for her. But um, right now I think it's close to midnight or one in the morning for Ellen, who's, um, I don't know if she's tuned in this, um, this week or not. Um, okay, so I, I may be spending a little bit more time on the, um, on the drawing at this point just trying to get a little bit better, uh, a little more accuracy before I really dive into the painting. I tend not to do any drawing with pencil. I just um, do um, some quick indication with paint and then like to go right into the painting because that's where I do a lot of adjusting to get um, forms to turn in space. So right now I can see um, her face, there's, it's kind of angular here. It's a little bit wider here. And then um, partially because the scarf is cutting into her cheek here, but also just um, the width here um, starts to get, um, starts to cut quickly. And in my drawing, it doesn't quite feel like that yet. So I'm just trying to, um, trying to get the sense of the, the shape to begin with, trying to mimic the feeling of the, of the shape of her face. And if I'm, if something's a little off in that initial drawing of, of the outer form, then I can feel it. Part of it is just probably not getting the, the width of the different elements, right? So I have her nose just right. Where the scarf starts to cross is a little bit further out. And are you just going to come in, see if I can match the color on her cheek, which is a blue-gray, slightly has some greens and violets in it, but it's probably like right down the middle blue. And so, and that's, yeah, that's about the right value. I'm just going to put a little bit in there because I just want to adjust that uh, initial marks that I, that I put in. And so I'm not seeing the, the drawn lines so much. <clears throat> so I don't think I put in, put down enough black on my palette for tonight, but there's not a lot of black in, I'm not gonna be using a lot of black in this painting. The one uh, last week and the one on Saturday had a lot, um, had a lot more blacks in the background. Okay. You, you guys are um, being very uh, shy tonight. That's okay. Okay. And this is where I'm not cutting in fast enough right here, which is why the drawing is feeling like it's off. Um, so the part of drawing where your brain wants to do what it thinks, um, 
something where something should be, um, even if the the drawing itself is or the the image itself or the resource or the the model is really quite different. You're trying to adjust um, just to what your brain thinks it should be, and so that's why initially this drawing um, tended to be really much further off because I my brain wants to think that the sh that where her scarf is cutting into her face is really the outline of her face and I want to make make it more normal make it like this is actually where the bottom of her chin would be and this is the the shape of her jaw and of course it's not like that the scarf is cutting into it so it's really quite different than what my brain wants it to be and so I have to fight against that, really measure and see where things are and then um, change it accordingly. So again, I'm just sort of working shape to shape here a little bit um, till just getting a sense of where things are. I'm gonna go back and uh, measure uh, the top of her shoulder, comes to about here. I can um, think about this negative shape, so I'm going to have to draw this up a little bit higher than it than it is. Okay, and um, something still looks wrong. Where her eyes are and the base of her nose, I know that distance is uh, too long, and so um, so real um, real quick, I need to measure again. Um, so I have the base of her nose to start with, I have it too low. So I can go ahead and start to adjust that. I know it's gonna be something more like this. And um, and then I, I probably have the eyes too high. Um, okay, let me just do that. I can see there's a couple of comments there. I will get to those in a second. So I have the eye just about a centimeter, a centimeter too high. So the combination of having the eyes too high and then the base of the nose too low um, was really, is kind of throwing the whole thing off. Um, so first of all, I want to say hi to Angela. Shout out to Angela. She's a coworker of mine. She's not an artist, but um, she um, does like to watch me paint. And so she'll, she'll be watching and multitasking here, but she usually also helps me by um, being my sound check, letting me know if the if I'm talking loud enough and um, and if I'm losing the connection. So I thin with um, with Gamsol. That's uh, if it's similar to Terpenoid. I think Gamsol may be a little bit more refined um, because it's not considered flammable. Um, because they've removed so much of the accelerant in um, in it, but it's an it's an odorless mineral spirit, and it's made by Gamblin Paints, and um, it's what I use to both clean my brushes and to use to th um, thin my paints as I work. So, and I like to paint with my paint kind of like a creamy, milky consistency. Um, for most of the painting. As I get into towards the end of the painting, I tend to want to come in a little bit thicker, especially um, where the lights of the, uh, where the um, highlights of the face are or some of the lighter areas of the skin. Then I think I find it more interesting if those areas of paint are thicker and more textural. And um, then that helps them come forward in space um, I think I need to measure those lips again, the separation of um, where her lips are. I have it just a touch too, too low, so it's something just like that. Um, okay. Um, all right, so, um, so I was saying about um, about the um, painting. So getting the paint to kind of, uh, oops, sorry about that. Getting the painting to kind of a creamy consistency gives me in a way a maximum amount of control over the volu values in the painting. And I can go back and I can get a fairly um, smooth 
um, surface and blends. Um, also, it helps with the painting a la prima, where you're painting wet into wet, and that kind of wetness of the paint helps uh, colors mix the colors that you've already established on the panel. I like, I like to paint on panels more than I do on canvas, just because I find the, the weave of the canvas a little bit too distracting. I know you can get like a primed linen, you can get it very fairly smooth where you're not really seeing the, the texture of the duct um, weave. And I just, um, there's something about panels I like. I also can control the surface. I can put gesso on them and then I can go and sand them a little bit um, to get just the right amount of tooth and absorbency that I want. For the most part, for the last um, few months, I've just been working with a gessoed surface that hasn't been sanded. And that's worked pretty well, especially um, gives me enough tooth that I can um, have a lot of control. But, um, but it is a little bit grabby. I don't know if you can hear it as I make a, as the brush marks, it really does have quite a bit of tooth to it. I don't tend to use um, other mediums. Occasionally, I'll put a little bit of safflower oil um, on um, to mix with my paints too. And that's if I want to do a little bit of um, transparent areas where I need just a little bit more film in the paint. So, um, so safflower oil is uh, a typical um, paint binder. It's used, Gamblin uses it, tends to use it in his cooler colors where um, yellowing from linseed oil would affect the color. And so, the, um, and he also has a white called um, Brilliant White, which instead of having linseed, the white is made with, uh, that it's a titanium uh, colorant for the white. And then he uses safflower oil and that gives the white a very bright, cool effect. I intend on picking some up soon so I can try playing around with that. But he has a line of colors called Radiant Colors, which uses all, um, it's, it's the a color pigment of uh, whatever uh, colors have the highest tinting strength mixed with that um, brilliant white. And that makes a, kind of a very bright pastel mixture. And I, I don't use that just because I like to have mix all my own colors and have a little bit more control over the color mixtures, but they may be a good place to start for some people who have trouble um, mixing some of those very intense uh, light colors. And um, it's, it's a sort of a premix of those. I don't tend to use uh, Liquin or um, I think there's another one that um, the Gamblin makes sort of is similar to Liquin. Liquin is a um, Liquin is a uh, Windsor Newton um, product, and I'm trying to I can't think of the the Gamsol one off the top of my head. But if it comes to me, I'll blurt it out or I'll put it in the in the description of the video once it's um, once it's posted. Okay, so the nose. So I didn't really knock the eyes, bring the eyes down yet, and I need to describe the tip of the nose a little bit because um, I drew the base of the nose, but the tip of the nose is up here somewhere, and just having just the um, base of the nose is just throwing me off a little bit. And also she has um, these shadows that um, from the underlighting here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just indicate those a little bit so I get a sense, a feel of where, where that is. And I am just going to give a little bit of a light pink um, for the underside of her nose, just to kind of get a sense of the color and the value that's going to be there. So I made this very dark line for the base of her nose, but if you look at in the photo, 
Um, there's very little value change there. You can just see that a little bit of indication of where the nostrils are. And um, so there's going to be a lot of subtlety in there. I want to keep some of the dark there just so I know where I am. <clears throat> but as I get, as I progress further, there's just going to be in here, there's going to be areas that are completely lost. Um, the difference in value between the tip of her nose here and her upper lip is so small that that really starts to be all the same color and value and then does get a little bit lighter on the upper lip. So as I get a little bit further in painting, I'm going to make those transitions a lot more subtle. Okay, so I need to bring down the the placement of her eyes a little bit, and that's, um, I may go a little bit too far, so I'll have to re-measure once I get get there. And so the whites, not the whites, the um, her iris of her eyes are sort of this gray, blue, green. I have some phthalo emerald and phthalo blue mixture here. Um, I will go in pretty, um, pretty strong and then as I lighten it up and play with it I'll it'll end up graying some of that color a little bit but I want to start off with quite a bit of color because it's harder to get color back in um, later okay let's see where I am here and that is right where her eyelashes are right there I made her um, upper lids a little heavy if you know what I mean, like it makes her look slightly drowsy. So if I come back where um, those eyelashes are hitting, will give um, the right feel to a little bit closer. Okay, and um, every art class that I've ever taken, painting, head painting class, um, the instructor has said, do not paint the highlights first. Well, usually they say do not paint the eyelashes. Um, but in this case, it wouldn't hurt so badly because they're all sort of grouping together. You don't see like separate hairs so much. So I'm just going to indicate where those are. But I really like, even though I'm wrong half the time, I like just putting in where the pupils are and then throwing the highlight right in there. Because what that does psychologically is that it establishes the surface quality um, of the eyes. I haven't even put in the, the whites of the eyes yet. Maybe I should do that first before I get um, four steps ahead. I'm trying to find the right brush here for that. So this is kind of a small area that I need to hit. And I know it's sort of a in this case kind of a bluish gray white it's not it's not white and you have to be careful not to go too light you're almost better off going too dark with the whites of the eyes because um because you need to have room for those very bright highlights to look like they're they're bright and if you paint the whites of the eyes white in which they aren't there's a lot of um, value. This is more like um, three steps darker than a white there. So I, and, but if you look compared to the where the highlight is in her eye, where um, where it's reflecting the the light, it looks like a window or something like that. There's um, this leading edge of it is pure, almost pure white. And and if you compare that to the whites of your her eye, it's that's um, obviously a lot darker. So, um, so you need to give yourself the right value structure if you want to get a sense of realism and you want to get a sense of light. That light, <clears throat> sorry, that light, <clears throat> I, I forgot to bring a glass of water here, so I may dash off at some point to get some ice water. Um, but you need to have that value structure. You need the darks to be supporting the lights. If your darks are too light, or if you paint things like the whites of the eyes too light, then you don't give yourself enough room structurally 
um, with between the light and the dark to be able to get that that sense of light um, you can get you know a feeling of that it's a person's face but it but without that sense of uh, looking like light is bouncing on it is bouncing off of the surface then you won't get that sort of that sense of awe that sense of it, ha it feels like something an object in space because you're not really making it feel like it's lit so that's um, that takes a lot of work to get that value control because partially in this case I'm painting on a white surface and I just know from lots of practice what values to come in with to get um, to be close to the value that I want towards the end of the painting but I also can adjust those um, but I'm saying because it because it's white it's a lot harder to judge the values because everything looks darker um, against that white background than, um, than it will when you um, get towards the, the end of the painting as you surround the colors with other light colors or darker colors those, those things that seem too dark will then start to seem lighter okay so So I am, um, so what do I want to do here? I can paint, I can block in big areas of color and block in where her, the scarf is. It looks like almost the scarf, there's two different color scarves, but I think it's more about the fact that it's dropping away into shadow. Maybe the dye is different in different parts. It almost doesn't matter. What I want to get is this luminosity around her face. Um, but I can work in two ways. I can put in the major areas of color or I can start sort of in the central area and start working out. Um, and I think it might be helpful in this case to do a little bit of both. Um, I'm looking for a bigger brush here to, um, oh, I think I found it. This is a nice um, big fat flat brush and I am going to mix with this Thalo Emerald. Yeah, I'm sorry you can't see my palette. One day I'll work it out so I can show everything. The palette, the resource image, and my painting. But um, I just have my smartphone, my iPhone that I'm doing this with. And so I'm not able to show everything quite yet. I, I think it's going to require a second camera and then some sort of controller box that I can um, Put on the screen the put in the live video the feeds from two different sources or three different sources if I want. Okay, so I'm just um, painting in, getting a large amount of this color in. Doesn't have to be perfect um, because I can come in later and do some do some correction of it. Just want to just get a sense of it. Okay, and I see there's that fold that goes darker. That could even have a bit of black in it to get the um, get the value right. Yeah, even more black. So, a lot of people presume that adding black to your color. Um, kills the intensity of the color and it does a little bit your a black is a neutral and you're mixing it with a strong color and you're gonna get uh, a less intense color but black is also a good tool for darkening a color while maintaining a certain amount of intensity in the color imagine you have a, a green that you want to make darker and your choices are to add uh, like a burnt sienna or to add black to it. So the burnt sienna is a complementary color and when you add that complementary to the color what it does, the first thing it does is it really pushes it hard to be to take the color out of it. 
and then it's also making it darker because uh, burnt sienna is a dark, fairly semi-transparent, or maybe it's closer to opaque, but it's a dark, darkish red-brown. And it really sucks the color out of that phthalo emerald. Or if I add black, which is in a way kind of a cool dark, um, and it's right towards the middle of the color wheel, then your resulting color mixture is going to be between black and that phthalo and it's going to be much higher in color than what you would get is than if you mixed that um, burnt sienna with with the green to get it darker now if you had a dark transparent green well that phthalo emerald is a transparent green i can just keep on painting thin layers of transparency until it's very, very dark. And that is the way to get the, the highest level of um, intensity out of that particular color. Okay, so um, I'm going to come in on the other side of the face. And let's see, I have a few people there. Still, if, um, if you feel up to it, please um, write in, um, leave me a comment in, in the feed and let me know um, where, you're, where you're watching from. I'm just um, curious. And um, some of you, um, I had heard that some of you wanted to draw or paint um, along with me. Let me know if you're doing that. Uh, then again, anyone who draws and paints with me, I will post your, your painting uh, only if you want, I'll post your um, painting or drawing to my Instagram page. I have about uh, 15,000 followers, so um, I don't think that all 15,000 would necessarily see it, but you, you may get a lot more people to see it than if you just um, post it to your page. Um, if you're a little bit shy about your work, you may not want to have me post it. That's fine. Only if you say that um, you send it to me and say that you want me to post it. <clears throat> okay, we have someone here, Twin Cities. I assume that's um, um, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, so you're, um, I think that's Central Central Time. So you're about one hour off from us. <clears throat> and um, so welcome, welcome to this. Um, portrait painting demo. Okay, so I have the colors um, sur that are surrounding the face. I'll put in a little indication of the hair, which is um, my palette actually doesn't have a any of the earth tones in it. Um, so that's, I really need the black sometimes to get um, some of the colors that I that I need, darker colors. So like a black mixed with orange is going to get me something very close to a burnt sienna. And um, that's, that may be too red actually for this bit of hair here. It's looking more greener than it is, um, more greener than it is red or somewhere in the middle, a little more neutral. Just want a sense of it to begin with. And I want to um, adjust some of these shapes so that it um, matches the photo a little bit better. And that will help me along as I get further in the painting, really judging um, where things are. Got to get those eyebrows up a little bit higher, I think. <clears throat> Let's see. Top of her eyebrow is right there. Okay, I got that. Same, this side just looks like a touch higher. Okay, I have my big hammer of a brush right now. That's fine. Um, sometimes you can get certain effects with larger brushes that you can't get with smaller brushes. You really can get the sense, the feel of the brush strokes, especially if you're coming in with a lot of paint and a loaded brush with a big brush and you're coming across the a good length of the painting, you can't get that sweep with a smaller brush. You just, um, you may feel like you don't have the same amount of control, 
with a with a big brush, but you're you're not going to get um, that kind of active liveliness um, that you would with a um, sorry. You're not going to get that liveliness with a small brush that you would you would with a much bigger brush. Okay, so I have a lot of colors in this mixture right now in her forehead. Um, it's mostly uh, quinacridone red and white, but it has a lot of the blacks and greens that I've been already uh, mixing with the same brush. If I wanted a much cleaner color, then I would have to do a, a bit of cleanup first, um, but that's okay. I, there's a lot of um, very neutral colors there in her forehead. They're leaning pink, but I can see uh, lots of purple here. This is going more towards a pink. There's some greens along her forehead. There's a, a reddish gray up here, and then there's some bluer grays on this side. And so, but all of those are very close in, in value and they're um, fairly neutral. So that um, to get that sort of the sense of those um, beautiful color um, relationships, they all have to be fairly neutral and close in value. Okay, I'm gonna go grab a little bit smaller brush for now for I've got this really worn down uh, filbert here. It's a bristle brush, almost has like a um, like a point to it, um, and that's fine for for doing things like those eyebrows that are got some greens and oranges in there, so mixed with um, black. So I have to just keep on mixing back and forth till I get the right um, the right feel to that color. And I think I just have to add a touch of white just to knock down the value. Yep, that's feeling better. So her eyebrows are pretty far from being dark enough to look black. So I don't, I mean, look at them compared to the, the dark area of her hair that's, um, that's blocked off from the light. So this is uh, much lighter. And Kelsey says um, that she's um, in North Carolina painting while watching, but on a commission. Okay, well, um, sounds like you're, um, we're painting along, but on different paintings. That's fine, or different subjects. I think that that's, um, you mentioned earlier that you might do that. So I'm going to just try to get a little bit of those uh, violets in there. I'm not really going light enough yet. Okay, there. That's a little bit better. There's going to be... When I start to get these values reading right, some of those color relationships are going to be really um, lovely if I can hold on to enough color in them so that you can see the, the color changes. I didn't really do much in terms of um, playing around with the uh, levels of this photo. Sometimes I can tease out a little bit stronger colors um, if I play around with it. And there's one that I did, um, a time lapse that I did several months ago. Um, it's a video that I talked about. Um, I really struggled and I talk about the what I went through to get the painting to work but um, what I did before I started the painting is I really pumped up the color in Photoshop by adjusting the values and the color separation the color saturation um, with some of the filters before I um, did the painting and sometimes I'll get the photo to be exactly where I want it to be before I, I touch any of the touch any of to actually start painting so I get I get the photo as close as I can to looking the way I'd like the finished painting to look okay 
I'm going to put in some of the lights that I'm seeing in the in her iris. So typically, I don't know if this is the case in this particular one because she's slightly underlit. Um, uh, it, it isn't the case, but normally when you have a light coming from above, it the light passes through the lens and lights the um, lower side of the iris. Um, so typically you want to just um, bump up the the value, meaning making it lighter than the rest of the iris. In this case, there's sort of a little bit of light in the middle, and because it's underlit, I don't know if you can notice that, but it's um, her lower lid is casting a shadow um, on the iris itself, and it's just a small distance between the the eyelid and the iris, but it's enough that there's a shadow there. And that um, getting that shadow in will help um, create a sense of depth in in the irises. And I can see I did go a little bit too dark in the whites of her eyes, but that's okay. And I can just I can come in and put in a much lighter lights where there needs to be an accent of light, and that will help drive the whole thing lighter. Um, when I there'll be a when I get to a certain point, if I'm getting my colors and values and um, and anatomy right, that it will just start to feel like um, almost photographic in a way, where it just starts to feel very real. And there's kind of that's kind of nice when you start to see that, like oh my god, in the middle of my painting. There's like a real eyeball looking at me. It's, it's a little bit eerie, but it's sort of, it might feel a little bit um, disfigured, um, part, potty parts, um, sort of in, in the middle of your painting. But it just means that um, you're doing a good job of getting those values, seeing all the, indicating the details that um, are necessary your that your brain needs to make it think it's a real thing and I'm indicating a little bit of the upper edge of that lower lid has a little bit darker and redder and I destroyed a little bit of the shape of that of that shadow on the iris so I'm going to just go back and paint it in and then I'm going to try to hit some of those higher higher value notes that are on the actual light um, on the iris itself and looking back and forth I can see I need just um, that very thin orange dark orangey dark um, separation between uh, at the top edge of her eyelid where the crease is the fold of um, that eyelid and it comes around and drops down so um, and then I need to come in with that pink very light pink that's above that and I have to um, clean my brush and get a lot of white in there to get to reach that color that very high key pink color that's that's right up there and I have to get move bump her eyebrow up a little bit okay so I do see there's just a slight value shift where that upper um, part of her eyeball it's not really her eyeball but there's the flesh that's over the eyeball the orbital area around her eye so here is like the skull right here has this opening that goes around here and then you have the eyeball sitting inside of it, and then you have these fleshy areas that that sit around that. So part of this describes the sphere of the eye, and then part of it is the flesh dropping in from the edge of the skull. Uh, it sounds kind of gross when I talk about it like that, but um, so being able to recognize where those forms are actually turning and even though it's such a subtle change, getting those changes in are an important um, part of, of letting the brain know where those, um, where those transitions occur to understand where, what the form is doing in those spots. 
again, we have this subtle, dark, well, not so subtle the way I put it in, but I can knock it back a little bit. It's subtle, dark, but it's against this area, almost the same value, but there's a little bit of color change in here. And then it goes lighter as it goes up. So I'm gonna, I am need to come back in with some light paint. And so as I, I'm not, if you notice, I'm not painting every little color change. Um, I'm not like a photorealist that I'm gonna go spot by spot and match that color and value. What I wanna do is get more of sort of that, those general forms <clears throat> looking right. There's some lighter areas in this brow. There's a darker edge on the top. And then um, the hair thins out. So you really do see kind of the pinks coming through kind of that greenish brown. So I don't need to paint every hair. I just need to get the, the feeling right so that if you look at the painting as a whole, you're starting to f feel what that thing is without painting every little detail. I don't, I don't want to get bogged down in, in the, the details themselves. I want to get the overall feel of it right, the simplifying it if I can, because it's that simplification that actually will make it read better. It's the distraction of trying to get every little detail that is gonna um, make it look stiff so this is um you know this is the way john singer Sargent painted for those who are big fans of his he looked to he was a um a master at simplification wherever he could simplify the form simplify the colors down to just a minimal amount of brush strokes he would do it it may, it may have taken him hundreds of passes to get that simplification, <laughs> um, which it seems kind of contradictory that he would have to paint something a hundred times to make it um, simpler. But um, but that's what he was after, and so that's what he did. He would uh, if he if something wasn't looking right, instead of just painting o over it, a lot of times he would scrape it back to the bare. Uh, canvas and then just paint it again and again and again until you know you talk some of uh, diaries of the sitters some letters of the sitters would talk about how they came and sat 80 100 times for him before he was um, finished with a painting and then you go look at the painting and it looks so damn simple um, so <laughs> It is, he was after a certain kind of uh, magic trick, I think. And the magic trick was making something that was actually quite complex and quite difficult look like it just, um, just kind of happened uh, with ease. And of course it, it didn't, but, um, but maybe it was easier for him than, than most people because he, had excellent control over colors and values and brush control to get just the effects that he wanted. But um, but he also was a, a kind of a perfectionist. So even if it was very close, sometimes he would want it exactly the way he wanted and would work and work until he got what he wanted. And um, he didn't often talk about his technique. What we do know is from people that were his sitters or observed him painting, or in some cases, um, students of his would talk about his technique. Um, and, but a lot, what you can tell is from the painting themselves. Descriptions of how he worked, how he approached the painting. He would often stand back at a distance and look at the painting and then look at the model, look at the sitter, look back and forth, not, not doing anything for long stretches of time, and then dashing forward and putting down one stroke or several strokes and then going back and 
standing at a distance again and observing um, and deciding where he was going to put down. Each stroke was just so intentional. And then at the end of the day, if it wasn't completed, if it wasn't where he wanted, he would rub down the whole painting, sometimes a whole face. He would, he would um, knock down all of the detail and just leave sort of a blurred uh, version of what he would paint, what he had painted. And then he would come back the next day. Um, he would sort of, um, his idea was that it would, um, he wanted everything to be um, done right on the first and final attempt, meaning that he would knock everything back that he had worked on the day before. So the next day he was kind of working fresh, um, a new kind of fresh start, but he would have a lot of the indications of the day before, kind of the shadows of the paint that he had put down. And so that's that's the way he worked. I work in a similar kind of way, but I'm not so exacting. I know I don't have the same level of control and um, and the ability to create that sense of realism. But I like the whole um, a la prima. I don't always. Um, I won't knock. I won't wipe something off. I'll just leave it and then paint over it. Sometimes I'll come back, and even if the painting has dried, I'll just come back and work over it. Um, so I won't have that same level of freshness that his paintings had. Um, but, you know, over time, some of his paintings haven't held up very well because he had so many layers of paint um, from trying over and over again. Um, one of my favorite paintings is a painting of... Uh, Miss Elizabeth um, Swinton. It's this uh, uh, light-haired, blonde-haired woman, longish hair, with a kind of a gossamer sleeved gown, and um, it had. But her arms were bare, so there's um, the gossamer came over her sleeves and was uh, quite um, satiny, glistening, and you look at her, the painting part of her face, and it's, um, the, the face is almost all done in variations of whites, and it's caked on quite thick, and if you look closely at the painting, it's, it's really quite badly cracked, and I think that's just because of the, the immense amount of paint that's on the surface, be, um, from him working over and over it, um, so many times. And some of it's just from age. Maybe my paintings won't hold up so well um, over the years, and so we'll have to see about that. Um, okay. So I have to adjust some of some of these lights and darks in here. I don't have the. There's this greenish shadow that's. Um, on the side of the nose, it's kind of near her eye, and I don't, I didn't have it quite in the right place, and I don't have the shadow of the nostril quite right yet either, but those things I will adjust as I go along, and I'll keep on looking back and forth and adjusting those until I get kind of that sense of um, realism that I'm looking for. Um, I think, in a way, my, my painting skills have progressed over the years because I can get more detail quicker um, than I used to. I used to sometimes paint whole paintings, just painting shape after shape and not really paying attention to the forms that they were creating. And so I would do a whole painting and not really have painted like the forms, the smaller forms in the nose or around the eyes, I'll just put in kind of the bigger shapes. And so the painting will kind of be there, but it will lack a lot of the actual details that are that are there. And But it would still work. It would just feel like a, a less um, detailed version of 
of what the way I paint now, um, I just wouldn't be. I just wouldn't be um, executing those details in a way because I didn't have the ability, the control to even um, get to them. I would be too busy working back and forth, um, trying to get some of the larger forms to be resolved. So I would just throw in a dark for the nostril and another dark here and another dark there and another color on the cheek. But it, um, without all the relationships of the anatomy, sometimes it wouldn't all tie together very well. And so, um, so it just seemed like it would be missing something. Let's make sure I have the relationship between these two eyes correct. That tear duct is almost exactly in the same height as each other. I can measure to make sure <clears throat> that tear duct is there. That tear duct is, yep, they're just so close that I can tell one might be slightly higher than the other, but um, not different enough for me to struggle to get it in such an exact spot when there's going to be other things in my painting that are going to be further off. Um, see, I'm not, I'm no John Singer Sargent. Okay, so now I've officially run out of black. And let's get that eyelash comes down a little bit lower there. And so I can see something that's really off in the in her eyebrow there because I have it too far away from her eye. So once I've gotten the eye in, assuming that the eye is in the right place now, I really should measure that, um, then I have to go back and remeasure that eyebrow. So just visually, I can see it's not right. Okay, so I have her eye very close to the right spot, maybe with a little bit of adjustment. Um, make the upper ed of, edge of that iris just a little bit higher. And I do need to throw in a light there. So I have a, I have a small square, square brush. It's a flat, a small flat. And if I get paint just on the corner of that, of one of the edges, then that's almost like a detail brush. I can just put some light exactly where I want to because I have a, just a little bit of dab of white paint sticking off that corner. And then I can just um, lay that little bit of thick paint right on exactly where I want it. Not be perfect, perfect, but it's pretty close. And with a little bit of adjustment, I can get it to look just like the photo, and at least close enough for this um, for the amount of detail that I have here. I'm just going to add a little bit of. Okay, I'm actually going to add. I'm going to turn my light a little bit. There's just not enough light on this painting. There. Okay, so when I have this video, I do the time lapse, it's gonna look like really dark and then all of a sudden it's gonna look a lot lighter. Um, but I hope you can see it a little bit better now. I may not have had enough light on it before. Um, should have thought of that before, but I had the light turned away for some reason. I don't remember now. <coughs> okay. So looking at some of the forms here, I have this, again, a greenish shadow that's on the top part of the cheek and blocking part of that lower lid here. And then this, I don't have the edge of her face quite in close enough, it looks like. Probably something like here. That's a closer to where it actually is. And so now I'm close enough, I can adjust some of the values around the eyes and really start to get a sense of, um, of really a sense of realism here. 
especially if I redraw that crease in her eyelid. Or I'm not sure I actually drew it um, in the first place, at least not very intentionally. And I'm just going to get a little bit of black on that, on the tip of my brush. See how slowly I'm painting? Um, sometimes there's this impression if you're painting kind of loosely and impressionistically and painterly whatever the terms are that you must be painting really fast and it took me a long time to realize that the painters that i really admired the ones that had a certain amount of control and I thought, hey, wow, they're just whipping that brush around and they're just like a fencer. They must be so like a like a martial artist that they can just hit that mark just perfectly, just, you know, flinging that brush around and just nailing it. And so after watching a few uh, videos of, of painters that I admired, I started to realize how slowly and deliberately they painted some of these areas that they were coming in. It almost seemed like a painful period of time just to put down one stroke. And then I was like, well, wait a minute. I thought they were like acrobats flying in the air and putting down that stroke of color just like after a 360 degree turn flying, flying in the air. And what's the meaning of this, that they're doing it like in slow motion? And so I began to realize that, no, that is, that's how you, if you want to get that level of accuracy and have it feel fresh and right the first time, that you actually do have to um, slow down and paint it um, much more deliberately. No flying in the air, no, no, you know, no one's watching you do it. It's, I mean, they were on video and I'm sort of live on video, but um, the artistry is in not how, um, how graceful you are in the process of painting it. The, the art is what the thing looks like when you're all done. And to get that um, kind of sense of accuracy, you do have to slow down and, and be very intentful about what you are putting down. And it took me a very long time to realize that. I, I suffered through a lot of paintings where um, with each brush stroke I was putting down, I was wiping out a lot of the, the hard fought um, work of, um, of previous brush strokes of flying through the air and, and having to get it right once in a while. And then I would come back with other brush strokes after that and totally um, totally mess it up almost with every next stroke and what I found is it, it, it's not so bad to paint in a way that there's some percentage of what you're painting is destructive to what you already have down because that um, does create a lot of interest but if what you're putting down is messing up everything that you've already done that you've thought was working then then you're not gonna, it's not gonna take very long before you, you're not, you've messed up everything that you've worked so hard for and the whole thing just starts to fall apart at some point. Um, that's not, it just wasn't a good way of working and it, but it took me a long time to get there before I was like, oh, okay, I can paint really rapidly in the beginning and get lots of paint down, but if I want to get the painting to look the way I want, I really do have to slow my heart rate down and be like one of those um, triathletes in the Winter Olympics where they have to ski and shoot, you know, and uh, you know the event that I'm talking about, it's like rifle cross-country skiing and then they have to shoot a target after they've been going several miles on cross-country skis and the key is that they have to train their heart just to stop pounding so hard so that they can hold the rifle steady to hit their mark and that's takes a lot of um, a lot of body control 
to do that. Now, I'm not saying that I have to do that, but but there is kind of a steadiness that you kind of have to to get to that allows you to um, to get that mark, put those marks down just the way that you want. Okay. So now I'm just doing a lot of looking back and forth between the photo and the painting and seeing that looking at the angles of things and the uh, shape of the of that eyelid I'm gonna redraw that crease for the second and third time so it's just a little bit closer to where it needs to be there's a lot of orange on that upper lid and that I don't have yet and there is so some of the formula that I use for painting eyelids is not present in this painting where the center of the lid is usually catching the light um, with a light source that's pretty close to straight on. In this case, the light is, there's a little bit of light over on this side. I painted that much too bright. I'm just gonna come back in with a dry brush and knock most of that off. I also need to come in a little bit lighter in the whites of the eyes. I do have a, a little bit too dark. So just again, slowing down, getting having a little bit of control so that I can see the tip of the brush and where it's laying down and getting those marks in. And then looking very closely at the shape of that eyelid and getting, there's just a little dark here where the eyelid touches the white of the eye and have a little bit of light. It's hard to tell. There's a little bit of artifacting in this photo, if anyone knows what artifacting is in a JPEG. And I might need to put reading glasses on for this. Where are those reading glasses when I need them? Hold on. Don't know where I put them. Anyway, I can, I can live without it. If I get, get a little bit more of a detail brush, I think I can do it. Um, well, here's a big fat detail brush that I haven't used yet. And so it has a perfect point on it, but that's like a number 12 or something. Number 10, I think. Yeah, it's still even a little bit stiff, still has the sizing on it. But that's going to allow me to put this little bit of light in here that's just along the eyelashes, just a touch. Okay, so now the values are very close. Um, I still want to adjust that upper lid a little. Oops, now I just, this is what I'm talking about, how I wasn't careful and I just um, painted over, smeared some of that eyelash into the eye where I didn't want to. And so now I have to go back and fix that or maybe fix just part of it because there's only part of it that's truly dark. And then um, it gives me an opportunity to adjust the iris a little bit and the placement of the pupil. So I am going to do that. But um, that's where I'm saying, like, if you don't slow down and you're not having at least a certain amount of caution, then you're going to just start um, start ruining things. And, and, uh, yeah, ruining things that you've already painted. I just want to say, but you also have to be careful that you don't make everything in your painting so precious that you can't you can't adjust it one of the things that happens is often that you'll paint something and it's just not quite in the right place. It's not the right value, but you like the way that thing looks in isolation. But in terms of the overall painting, it just may not be working. And that's where you really have to then um, have some discipline and repaint something that's already painted. And that for a lot of people can be, that could be the biggest reason why you're not um, having success in your paintings because of that fear of fixing something that needs fixing, the fear of 
um, not being able to to paint it again as well as you already have it painted. And that's something that held me back for a long time and then I just uh, got over it and realized, no, I gotta fix those things and I got to, it doesn't matter how good it looks, it, do, it won't look, the whole painting won't look good unless I repaint that thing. And even if I don't paint it quite to the same quality in a way it doesn't matter as long as you get the whole painting working then that little no one's going to care whether you had a perfect eyeball in a horrible painting i'm just telling you now no one's going to put it in a museum if it's like oh well this is one of so such and such finest works i, I mean at least the eyeball is his finest work the rest of the painting eh. um so here i'm talking i'm getting a little crazy here so um so yes, no, there's no paintings in a museum that horrible paintings with a perfect eyeball. Um, it's usually more that it's an okay eyeball, but the painting is gorgeous. I mean, look at the eyeballs, look at some of the paintings of Rembrandt and look at how thick and and abstract some of the features are when you get up close to it it just looks like uh, big gobs of crazy paint um, but when you stand back and look at it it just looks like pieces of skin that you can just go up and grab and same with uh, some of sergeant paintings it just looks like a, a mess of paint up close but when you actually then get up close, I mean, back up from it, it all comes together in such a gorgeous way. Okay, so there's some really, a lot of subtleties going on here that I'm working really hard to get. And um, it's gonna take a little bit of back and forth before some of those things start to read. There's some pretty interesting yellow greens in this little corner here actually with a bit of black in it or I should say I need to mix a little bit of black in it to try to get that color and value that I'm after okay so <clears throat> still need to um, get the shape of this eye right the, the edges aren't pointing kind of in the right direction I don't have this tear duct pointing down enough um, to get the character of her eye. If you look at Shay's eyes, they kind of have this um, this nice almond shape to them. And the, the, um, the edges, the corners of her eye are kind of pointing downward. And it, and it kind of creates um, a certain sense to, um, to the eyes that I'm not quite getting it because I don't have um, those corners quite making the right shape yet. It's actually those little things that, besides the overall shape of the head, but it's those little things, those details about how the corners of the mouth are, how the corners of the eyes are, the, the correct placement of things is hugely helpful, but those little details are really what help um, build a likeness of somebody. Otherwise, you're just kind of generalizing and it looks like, you know, it'll look like a painting of a girl. It'll look like a painting of a person, but it won't look um, so much like that person until you get some of the subtleties of those details um, working for you because it's those thousand little things that make someone look like the person that they are. And sometimes it just takes very carefully studying, you know, what is the shape of that mouth? What is the shape of her eyes? What are the subtleties there? Okay, now I need, I need my blacks to get this, start to get the shadow area. Now I've just painted that really neutral, but I can come back in with some blues and greens. Okay, you guys are being awfully quiet out there. I know there's there's supposedly there's seven of you that are tuned in. Um, you know, just 
let me know that I'm not here alone doing this. <laughs> it's fine. I'm having, I'm enjoying myself painting, so, but, um, and at least for the repost later, my um, commentary, I think, will help whoever tunes in. So that's fine. And I know Kelsey's out there. She's got, she's busy working on her painting. And Angela is multitasking out there somewhere. Um, okay, so her chin, I don't have it quite dark enough yet. Um, so I'm going to keep on pushing um, the values darker on there. And the separation between her chin and that scarf, I'm just going to push a little darker. And now I really need to start getting that shape of her mouth right. Um, Pasha's here joining us. Say hi, Pasha. Meow? Okay. I know, I know, no one's paying attention to you. Everyone's on there doing their thing on their own computers. Everyone's ignored you. Okay, I'm going to take a second break to scratch Pasha's head. Okay, I'm getting a little bit of paint on you. I hope that's okay. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, you got some dried stuff on your... Or what is that? Okay, well, I've got some people here watching me paint, Pasha, so I'm going to get back to that, okay? Okay, thanks. Okay, so the separation of the lips, my go-to color usually is alizarin permanent. It's a very, very dark, transparent red that's excellent for getting sort of the that dark shadowy shape separation. Um, I'm also going to come in, I'm seeing that my drawing of where the nostrils are are a little bit off. I really want to try to get the character of the base of her nose, the, the wing of her nostrils have a really a particular shape to them, and I want to pay attention to that. And then the shadow from that underlighting starts to be apparent on the tip, uh, the upper tip of her nose. And so, and there's a little bit of oranges and reds coming into that, so I want to be able to express those colors there and just keep on dropping them down lower and then right on the very edge leading tip of her nose is a highlight and I want to get that highlight I may even exaggerate it a little bit because um, because I'm not sure the other areas around it are dark enough to support it otherwise and so if I go, I know it's going to be one of the lightest lights in my painting, so I'm just going to start off just punching it white, and I can always darken it up a little bit later. Um, I tend to try to overcompensate in areas where I know that I'm not going to naturally paint something in the right um, direction. If I know I'm going to paint something too light, then I'll try to paint it too dark. And if I know I'm going to paint something too dark, or if I know that I'm not going to put enough color in something, then I'll try to punch the color a little bit. And that, that way I can always adjust it, but at least it gets me out of that space where I'm being too tentative with something or making a, sort of the same um, mental error over and over again. Just getting, again, working on the shape of that nose. And that highlight, I need to come in even higher than I did. And this is where, it's a good thing I came in too white because now some of the colors that I'm putting down are mixing with other colors that I've already put down. So I'm really going to struggle to make it um, light enough. Also, there's this really lovely... Um, bluish, uh, I think I'm going to get there with ultramarine mixed with white, sort of on the side of her nose, sort of purpley bluish color. 
let me get a touch of the dioxazine, dioxazine um, purple. Um, very high um, tinting strength, um, but it's almost that's almost not light enough yet. Tinting strength is the ability for a color to hold on to its um, saturation level when you've mixed a lot of white with it. And this particular purple is the the best of all the colors at doing that. It requires just only a little bit of that color mixed with um, a large amount of white and it will still hold on to a pretty good amount of its color where most colors will lose almost all of their intensity uh, mixed with that much white. Okay, so um, you can see there's some things that are still off in the drawing. I don't have that eyebrow quite low enough. And I don't quite have it the right shape either. That's probably what's throwing me off. So there's a part here, the upper part of the eyebrow cuts a little bit faster here. And then curves around and then there's a little more eyebrow here. And I didn't make that quite dark enough, but that's okay. This is where you see some of the flesh um, tones coming through the hairs and so I don't have to again don't have to draw every hair I can squint down and approximate that color and um, and that's what your brain will do too when it sees approximation of that color it will understand that there's some hair and some flesh tones coming through in that mixture and it will automatically interpret that as um, thinner hairs in that spot. <clears throat> Thank you, brain, for doing all that work for us, where, our, where my brush strokes fail to put in all that information, and your cerebral cortex does all the rest. It's amazing. Okay. There's some really bright blue notes. Let's see if I can get it. Almost pure ultramarine blue with white right in up here. Oh yeah, there we go. That's the color I wanted. Where were you before? Okay. So again, that eyebrow is just feeling a smidge too high. I'm just going to come down. I'm just going to come down lower. Just gonna move it down. I know when I measured it, it seemed like it was in the right place, but apparently it's not. So I'm just going to bring the whole thing down. Bring it all down, carve it up. Okay. So yeah, oh, that's feeling better. Okay, I don't know what I had off there. I know it's almost worth not looking back and just just figuring something, I was measuring something wrong somehow, somewhere. And of course, now the other eyebrow is um, too high, obviously too high, so I have to do the same thing with that other eyebrow. And it's got some violets on the top edge, so I'm just going to get some very light violets and I'm just going to carve, start carving away. Oh, not enough white. Or maybe it was right. I just I didn't have it painted dark enough before. So I'm going to try to get that value again. Oh yeah, that's actually perfect because I wasn't um, dark enough on that side. So that's going to help us um, turn that form a little bit. I'm going to try to get that um, the shadow that comes across right here start to indicate that. That's um, helping us read that form. Okay, there's um, Melania uh, Monet or Moneta that just um, sent me a 
comment. Uh, watching with husband from Alabama. Both are painters. Well, um, welcome. I hope you're enjoying this, and um, I'm hopefully some of what I'm saying doesn't just sound like complete nonsense. But um, I mean, it makes sense to me. But you know, once you say it out loud, you just never know if anyone ever un um, truly understands what you're saying. <clears throat> but. Um, I can start to see um, if I can get a little bit more values in the face um, filled in. Um, it is starting to feel um, the way I want it to feel. I'm starting to feel the shadows in the face. I'm starting to feel where some of those forms are turning and getting the, um, some of the subtleties around her face. Um, these little um, marks around the the eyelids, a little bit of um, redder colors that are, um, I don't want to call it blotchiness, but they're just uh, patches of a little bit redder or lighter, um, more intense color in her face and her cheeks, and um, getting the colors and values right um, as I work, just adjusting those um, are, is really helping get those things to read properly. Okay, just need a little more reds and violets. So I can't really show you my palette that easily right now, but I just have uh, a big mess of tints of whites and colors mixed around on my palette, going off in all kinds of different directions. And I just keep on, wherever I want to go in a section, I'm just picking up already existing colors on my palette, pools of color that are already in that direction. Um, sometimes I just need to go back and find some, uh, mix some pure color. So if you can see right in here, there's a light area that um, has a lot of red in it. And the only way that I'm going to get that is by really cleaning up my palette a little bit, making a clean area, cleaning up my brush, picking up a little bit of the quinacridone red, just a bit, mixed with a lot of white and a lot a lot of white apparently because i i was closer to equal parts of each and that was not the thing okay so now i thought i cleaned it up a bit but i may have to go just a little bit darker to get the color to read and then make sure that i'm darker and grayer around around the edges of that color area and then just see, just alongside the nostril, you can see that red really starting to um, show itself. So that that's helping getting that, getting that color to read properly. I'm gonna drop this nostril down a little bit lower, making it thinner. Okay. Um, and I'm missing a shadow on the side of her nose. Some violets and reds in it. Okay, this is where I gotta slow myself down, get my heart rate down so that I can come in with the, uh, with the kill shot. Okay, not even dark enough yet. So there's just a touch of a more neutral dark there, so I'm getting a little bit more black into the paint. And, and then there's a spot with a little more red in it. So, gotta get some more red on the brush to get that. Okay, and some of that, this is a little bit of shadow here, uh, as I paint into it by accident. Uh, a little bit of shadow there that's um, from the underlighting. I, I think it's been a long time since I've done an underlit face um, where you have the tip of the nose, the under part of the nose be lighter, you have the upper lip that's lighter, you have the, the lower eyelids lighter than their counterparts, um, the upper eyelids or the, or the lower lip. So, so the lower lip is facing up, so that's why it is darker. 
and the upper lip is facing down and that's why it's lighter. The eyelids, the lower eyelid is facing down so it's catching the light where the upper lid is facing up so it is going to be darker. So I just need to, even if I don't have the values exactly right, I want to make sure that I have those value differences between the upper lid and the lower lid. So I'm just coming in with some lights there to really, um, and then I want to carve up a little bit in up towards that tear duct to get sort of to get that right shape. Okay, so still there's some things a little bit off in my drawing, but I feel like I'm getting closer and closer so that um, it gives me a place where I can really start to um, do some fine-tuning on some of these shapes. Um, little things, I mean it's just sometimes it's the face has just your where you've indicated in the painting just may be so subtly off but that little distance sometimes makes a huge difference so just going back and adjusting, making fine-tuning of those things, just uh, it make, can make the world of difference. Um, sometimes if you look at a lot of um, portrait paintings, sometimes you'll see ones that it looks really good, but there's just something a little bit off about it. And it's usually those, those measurements of where the relationships are. They're just a little bit off or the value structure is just a little bit off and it just, you just see it immediately. It just doesn't feel right. And the, as you, as you get more practice and as you do more and more, then you have, you start to get a lot more control over those subtleties. And you also realize what a big difference they make in the, in the quality of the outcome. So then you, learn to spend more time and be more careful about getting those relationships just right. Um, it makes a big difference in, in getting things to read properly. Here I just have, I've made that transition too strong right here. I'm just going to knock it back a little bit. And then I have this a little bit of greenish yellowish light that comes in right in the spot. And then I do have it, have it dark where it really should be light. So going in and adjusting some of those things should help. Um, I have even the base of her nose, I kind of have at the wrong angle. And that's really important to have all of the the major angles of the face aligned properly. Um, they should generally all be parallel to each other. So if I look at the mouth, the base of the nose, the eyes, the eyebrows, they all should, unless um, the expression dictates otherwise, they should, they should be in the general, general alignment of all those things. And, um, so coming back in and adjusting those alignments also really help in the likeness and also making it feel like the anatomy is right. <clears throat> I am going to have to take a 30 second break to get some ice water because my, my voice is going to start to go otherwise. So um, bear with me people, um, I will be back in a flash. Okay, and I'm back. Oh, much better, much better. Um, yeah, so I'm still using Gamsol to thin. I'm, I'm essentially, every time I wash the brush, I have a little bit of Gamsol on the brush. And um, I'm keeping the paints kind of a fairly creamy consistency. Um, I've just, that's just the way that I've, um, 
I've been painting for years, and so I don't even think about how much um, thinner that I'm adding. I just um, just adding little bit as I'm painting, and it's just I'll know if the paint is too thin or too thick pretty quickly. Just gotten used to um, getting a little bit of touch of it on the brush as I go. I know there's some painters that are very intentional about how much of um, Damar varnish or liquid or other things and in relationship to thinner and all these. And um, for me, it just gets too complicated. I like to keep it simple. I can do a good job with just thinning the paint with the Gamsol or like I said, occasionally a touch of, uh, and sometimes I'll pour the safflower oil right into my um, my um, brush cleaning solution so that every time I clean the brush it's also getting a little bit of oil on it and that helps keep the painting wet for much longer keeps the paints wet because essentially that those oils have a um, it's not even a drying time oils don't exactly dry they oxidize and that's what makes them um, harden over time they're not drying in the traditional sense that something's evaporating out of them. Like um, water-based paints, the water actually is leaving the, leaving the mixture and just leaving the, the pigment um, with a little bit of binder. If it's watercolors and it's gum, Arabic is the binder. And um, and has a lot of um, water you're diluting the color when you use it to paint and then and then the water dries out of it <clears throat> in this case the uh, yes the gamsol is is evaporating but if you're mixing oils into the paint um, then the oils aren't evaporating they're just curing and the, as they cure they get harder and um, this is actually why um, paintings uh, crack um, as they cure. I'm just um, talking out of my rear here, but um, those um, oils in the paint are curing at different rates. And then, um, and then sometimes the thinners will get also trapped in the paint and they have nowhere to go. And, the, and subsequently will, um, the painting surface will dry at different speeds and the paint will shrink at different speeds and it will crack the surface. There's actually some very good videos online that explain it much better than I have. So feel, feel free to uh, educate yourself and go on YouTube and find some better explanations than what I just said. Um, sometimes I say things with authority. Um, Angela probably uh, knows this a little bit and it will just sound like I know what I'm talking about even though I don't. And, um, and then they just, people just assume, well, he must know what he's talking about. It sounds like he knows what he's saying. Um, <clears throat> but I try not to um, make stuff up that often. I try to, um, when I say something, I try to actually know what it is that I'm talking about. And if I don't, I'll just say so. I don't have to be one of those people that's right all the time. I, that's just way too annoying. <clears throat> okay, so let me see how I'm doing here. Let me, I have to shift around a little bit so I'm getting these things um, sort of the same sight size so that I'm, I look at both and they're essentially the same size and the same angle so that um, I can see where things are off um, pretty quickly. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice there. It's, um, let me get a little more water. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't help that I just poured a bunch of sparkling water. It's not really, it's not really helping. Um, okay. Let's fix this edge. Okay. So I just actually made that edge a lot softer than it is in the photo, and I kind of like that because it feels um, it feels like it needs to be softer to 
um, support the details in the face. So I will try to keep that if I can. And got a little paint on my monitor. That's not helping me see very well. I got some areas of light right here on the cheek. This is like um, reflecting the, the light right back at us. <clears throat> and then um, trying to get some of those light pinks that are right underneath the nose around the, the philtrum of the nose. And that's a fancy word, just meaning that like groove shape um, around the nose. I just learned that a couple weeks ago. That it's called the philtrum, so I use it whenever I can because it makes me sound smart. Um, but you don't need to know the names of everything to paint them. You just need to just get a sense of of what they tend to look like, how things turn. Um, you don't have to be a genius at anatomy, but you do have to like all the anatomical names for everything, but you just have to start to develop a mental map of the shapes of things in your head. Um, as you paint them more and more, that map just gets better. It helps some people to know the name of each thing. Um, it doesn't really help me that much. I'm a much more visual person than a than a literal person, and so I don't I don't need the names to remember the shapes. Um, I'm not. I I took some very high level anatomy classes in school, and we went over the name of every major muscle in the body, and and most of the bones, and. Um, that was sort of the exterior that led to the exterior shapes of things. But what was more important for me was to remember the, the shapes. The human body is interesting to paint because you can paint it a million times and you'll never, it will never look exactly the same. Each time you go to paint a live figure model, some aspect of it will be different than every other time that you've painted it. And so knowing kind of how pieces fit together and sort of what's this, you know, what's making up those shapes is helpful, but knowing the names of them doesn't really do you that much. Um, it's good if you're teaching a class, but if you're painting it, being able to call the name out of each thing is, um, at some point, it starts to be kind of irrelevant. Okay. What's important, though, is recognizing um, the subtle changes of things and how they affect your overall painting. So I have a lot, this is, cheek is lighter and has a little bit, um, cooler color than the things around it. And I need the, those differences to get the, the light to read. And I need the kind of the softness going there to feel, so you start to feel the form, um, that softness around the mouth. So I'm just gonna knock back a little bit the <clears throat> those transitions between one value and one color to the next, I want those to be fairly soft here. I don't want you to see the paint. I just want you to see, um, have a feeling of the flesh that's there. <clears throat> and I have to keep on doing that, keep on, I'm not really blending as much as I am just softening, um, I know it sounds like I'm blending when I say this, but I'm just softening the difference between in between things and then I'll come back with a little bit of paint and adjust it so it's so what you, you are seeing kind of um, fresh paint coming down each time if all I'm doing is blending the whole thing will start to look terrible so I see there's light here and then it transitions into there's a little bit of band of color along the edge of where it goes into more shadow and then um, and then I get kind of a cooler, cooler shadow here. I want to 
put a, I went a little bit too light there, but I want to put a, add a little bit extra blue in there because that will help this form. It's kind of sort of changing direction, so having that color change also helps um, helps you feel uh, the sense of that light. Okay, and I'm having that little bit of that pink come down along the cheek there. Okay, so by now um, you should start to feel some of those um, forms. I'm not getting that color transition here into the shadow. It's like a little bit of a lighter blue before it gets into that darker blue. I'm exaggerating it there a little bit. And it not having the, the edge of that shadow shape in the right place, it really starts to change direction right below the eyelash here and in the photo somewhere up there so that's much here and then the shadow that means the the edge of her face and the shadow where the hair is is actually over a little bit more somewhere around there and then that scarf is cutting in much tighter than I have it. So if I can see those things and then adjust them as I go along, then by the time I'm done, I'll, um, more things will feel like they're right than wrong. Painting doesn't have to be perfect when I'm all done, but if I can get uh, uh, large portions of it doing what um, what I'm seeing in the photo, then the overall effect will be right. Um, it's okay to have some ac inaccuracy, but but it, that inaccuracy has to be supported by a fair amount of accuracy. It can't just be that the whole painting is not accurate. Um, you need to have enough down that is um, to give that sense of realism, you have to have enough that's right so that things are feeling right overall. And sometimes that those little bits that aren't accurate give the painting a lot more life. Um, so some degrees uh, be more accurate, but also loosen up a little bit. One of the things I've been doing lately is I've been giving myself much stricter time limits on on the paintings. Um, right now I'm um, close to the two hour mark. Um, I've been going uh, two hours generally. I think I want um, the extra. I want to gonna go two and a half hours tonight just so that I can get some of the rest of this background in, get her indication of her hand some of the shoulder i mean think i think part of it is i have stopped quite a bit to explain some things so that has slowed me down a little bit on the other nights i really did power through during my explanations and didn't stop so i was able to get uh, most of the painting done in that two hour time span and in each one, I did work a little bit after I went offline. It's just a little bit easier to, to slow down and to look and make some finer adjustments when there isn't an audience. Um, okay. Getting, do some lot looser strokes in here. They really don't matter. The looseness, is, in a way, for some of these supporting areas are almost necessary to um, give more importance to um, the areas of the face that are painted with more detail. Right, I can come in with some fairly large strokes there. Those, those might be the finished strokes here, so I, I want them to See if I can get them to feel right 
right off the bat. Okay, a little more blue in that. So I have the shadow that's uh, of the scarf that's a fairly intense blue. Let's see, got the edge here, got a fold. Her fingers are up here. Her pinky, it comes down to that corner. Then we have more of the dark blue, greenish blue. I'm painting sort of the negative shape of the fingers. If I'm accurate enough, that hand will come together pretty quickly. If not, then it will be um, a painful process to get it to read right. Um, time will only tell. <clears throat> okay. So I have a lot of the light effect working in the face right now. I don't have to be, again, as exact with this scarf in this part of the painting. And I really want to show off some of the brushwork. So if I do this right, those color colors are starting to feel a little bit too punchy without any black in them so the black is just helping uh, kick back the color a little bit so it doesn't feel like it's a, a some kind of neon light and again those darks are needed to help support this that feeling of light So, um, so I'm going to take another about 35 minutes to finish for those that are in our studio audience tonight. Um, for those of you that are tuned in that aren't um, subscribed to my channel, I highly recommend that you subscribe and um, click on the, um, the notification bell. And that way you'll be um, then notified by email or inside the app on your phone that, um, that I'm starting a, a live um, demo for subsequent weeks. So I plan on doing this every Tuesday. I think there's a, a Tuesday in the summer that I won't be able to do it because I'll be away on vacation. But, um, but generally, um, every Tuesday, I will do this. I'll try to come up with a replacement video the Tuesday that I won't be able to, to post this live. <clears throat> and, uh, so, but anyway, if you do subscribe, that way you do get notifications when I, um, when I do go live. So you don't have to um, necessarily remember. And um, I'm still trying to figure out how to post a text notification to all my um, subscribers. I think that there's special apps out there that help you do that. Right now on YouTube, you can send a note to each of your subscribers individually, but the app doesn't give you a way of, um, of sending a, a sort of a broadcast message to all your subscribers. So at some point I'll figure out how to do that. But if you're, if you're not getting notifications and you, um, 
you probably won't get those. YouTube, um, when you do something, when you post a new video, YouTube um, lets your subscribers know sparingly. Um, it's part of the algorithm. It allows them to test um, the likability and the value of a video to some of your subscribers before they release it to all your subscribers. So unless you say you want to get all notifications, you're not necessarily going to get um, those notifications. That's just how the app works. I, I don't love it. I would like it if I do something, if I post a video that all of my subscribers are told, hey, he posted a video, but it doesn't work that way. Um, I'm not sure what the subscribership is for if it doesn't do that, but <clears throat> but I, you know, I'm just I'm just using the system. I don't design it, and so that's just the way it works. Okay, so I am gonna go ahead and try to get to this hand pretty quickly. I kind of I want it in the painting. Um, I can decide if it's not working. I can just um, paint it out. And so, or I may just get a good start on it and then paint the rest of it offline. Okay, so I need to get some measurements here to figure out where the heck it is. So the top of it starts right there. There's a finger, and then another finger. And then we have third finger coming down, and we have a shadow in between the fingers and then there we have the pinky which is a little bit pink so I don't know if I ever thought about that before they call it the pinky because maybe it gets a little more pink color than the other fingers I don't know if that's the the idea of where that name comes from so not, I'm not getting a lot of paint coming off the brush right now, but um, but that's okay. So I'm just, um, I think I just have just enough information there to start to um, refine the, the color of the scarf that's around it, that's sort of um, creating those shapes. And each pass I do, I can do a little bit more refinement. Getting some red color in here in the shadow. Getting to some of my naphtha red there. Okay, and you can see the palm of her hand here. So I'm just going to put in a little bit of uh, orangey white color there. And it has a little bit of a green uh, reflected light along the edge of it and then some dark of the scarf on the bottom edge of the pinky there not quite getting the right angle yet to the pinky let's see if I can adjust that for it causing me too much problems and there's a little a little pink light edge too dark, but I'm just sort of indicating it right now. Let's see if I can get a little bit better with the shadow here. Okay, 
so. Let's see. If I can get some of this to read. There's some greens and blues on the top edge of those fingers right here. Some reds, violets. There's lots of colors in there. Mostly because they're kind of going into shadow. And so I need the dark around it to really support um, those fingers that are in shadow. Um, I don't have any white left on my palette. It's, that's kind of working against myself if I don't have the colors that I need. It's one of my... Um, one of my bad habits is I'll keep on painting even though I don't have the color that I need to get the mixture that I want. Oops. Okay, excuse me. Wow, <laughs> trying to pull the colors out of my bag. Um, and then I might as well dig for the black while I'm here. Okay, so. 9.30, I'm going to be wrapping this up. I'm making good progress on the hand. I made good progress on the face. Um, it's still looking a little mushy, um, but I think I have enough time to um, get done everything that I want to without um, boring you guys to tears. And thank you for hanging in there. Um, I hope that the finish of this painting is going to make it all worth it. Um, this greenish light comes right along the fingertip and then has a stronger light that comes in right here between the two fingers. Um, and I'm going to need a little bit of a darker red on that fingertip. It's actually all kinds of colors. Um, just very subtle color changes, letting us know where the nail is with a little bit of greenish shadow along that edge. And then um, there's a little bit of a curve in this fold here, which I don't really have yet um, quite right, but that's okay. And I made that shadow, there's something a little bit not right about it, but I'm just going to knock it back and try it again. Okay, that actually is feeling better even though there's less detail than before. <clears throat> a little bit of a lighter edge to the edge of that finger. And then there's some um, there's some light hitting the finger right here, and then before it goes into shadow. And then that light shows up again towards the fingertip. Don't really need to paint so much detail. I just need to get the right amount of detail in for it to read properly. Getting the Exterior shape, though, is really important to getting this to read. So I kind of painting with one eye closed, the other one open squinting a little bit. That's helping me reduce the, the details so I can see the overall larger shapes. Okay, now if I just get this lower edge of the palm right, I think this hand is going to start to pull together. Let's, I need to cut into that 
finger sooner. Okay. It's just really um, some small details which will get this these fingers to read. It's not going to take a lot. I hopefully it won't take a lot, or I'm not doing it right. The trick is to um, to make it really minimal. bit of highlight there a little bit on the edge of this pinky and then if I reading it right the palm is just darker than what I have it and so if I push that darker then hopefully I'm gonna get that pinky to read well almost there it just needs some of the lighter color that's there. I'm going to cheat. There's a little bit of color in this highlight there. And I'm just coming in with white because really don't have the time to struggle with getting enough intensity in that. Okay, almost there. Almost there. I'm just going almost pure yellow and white here to get the sense of light hitting that So I'm not going to put in much more detail than that. Just going to get bump up that shadow value down a little bit. Okay. So this finger comes down, and one more try with this shadow here. Get a little more red in that. And okay, just made, just made a few little adjustments there. Okay. I'm going to leave that, um, those fingers pretty much for now so that I can finish off the face and then come back in and see if it needs a little more work later. But I think I kind of have got the overall feel of it now. Let me just adjust this right up here. in the shadow. Okay. The, the fingers are pretty close. I have a couple things wrong, so they're just not quite reading. Um, mm -hmm. Reading yet, but, but pretty, pretty close. Okay, so let's finish off that face. We got about 20 minutes here to do it. I'm going to just leave parts of the panel white. I think I just want to do fill in this little bit of, of um, bright tealish color that's here in the. This is going to also support the hand a little bit by allowing those lights to feel like they're the right value. Okay, and let's see if I can soften up the shadow shape a little bit. And 
to soften up this shape as it disappears into shadow. Okay, let's make the face work. That's kind of where I am right now. If I can make the face work, then everything else will fall into place. <clears throat> so, what do you want? which brush do I want? I think I want a nice, um, flat, kind of chisel -y. Let me look at these other brushes. Okay, I think the flat that I'm was using, it just feels a little bit small. This one is a little bit beat up, but it may be closer to what I want. If you can see, it's a flat that's sort of lost its, um, its edge a little bit. I'm gonna knock back some things so that the the overall form pulls together and this is that's a little bit of blending it's okay I'm letting myself blend a little bit I've got green hair greenish yellow hair okay and then the edge of her face I do think I need to make that edge softer well, I have to make it in the right place, but it does have a little bit of different shape to it than I put. But if I can soften up those edges a little bit, I think that will help pull the details in her face forward. I'm starting to be a little more intentional about my edges. I used to just copy all the edges that I would see in the photo, and photos tend to to make most edges pretty hard unless um, you really skilled photographer and know how to get the apertures um, setting so that you have a good combination of hard and soft edges. Um, but as a painter, I can decide which edges I want sharp and which ones that I don't. I want to um, just have a little more contrast there. Um, I'm giving her the wrong shape. Okay, and got a little bit too much um, crap in the paint, but that's okay. That's helping support that, um, that light that's hitting on the cheek here. Okay, um, so I'm just really, as much as I can, adjusting the values around the face, um, making sure that the lighting effect is working. <clears throat> Wherever I can maybe exaggerate that or support it a little bit, not don't get too crazy with the values, but um, just really squinting hard so I can see like where things are darker and lighter. Missing some of the color in this crease in the nose a little bit. That color is, um, it does help um, give a sense of reality to it because those, that color is partially the local color or where light's transitioning. Sometimes we'll, we'll be able to see more color in those areas more than in the shadow and more in the lighter lights, kind of more like the halftone areas is where it's picking up most of the getting, having more room for you to see the color. Okay, I'm really pushing to try to get a feeling of realism that's there. It's not about painting every little shape. It's more about getting the overall um, values and shapes and relationships correct. Just little things, but not details, little changes in the overall value structure or having the value structure 
overall correct. So when I say value structure, so the light shadow on the side of the nose will be the right value in relationship to the rest of the nose or the cheek next to it or the overall other f um, forms in the face. I've just got a little bit of light there where it doesn't belong. That's too dark. So I'll go in and adjust it again. And that's, that's about right. Okay. So there's little bits, little hints of light, of these light blues that come in here. If I can get them the right value, they'll read right. That's too, first I had it too dark and then too light. So needs to be something in between. Okay, that's looking a little bit better, but not getting some of these shapes right yet. Just going, I'm cruising a little bit faster because I'm trying to push myself to get um, this done in time without uh, messing up what I already have done. Okay, need purpley color in here. So I have the thinnest red line right there, and I'm going to carve into that. So even if you don't have a thin or tiny brush, you still can get little details by painting one edge of it and then carving into the other edge um, with the same brush until you have just the faintest line. Um, so that's, that's one way of working the paint with a larger brush that you can get some pretty fine detail if you, if you paint things in a certain order. That shadow on the other side of her nose, it's not really a shadow, it's just you, it just is a little bit lighter than the highlight. And it's just this is where I said it's very subtle. You can almost lose the edges in here. In fact, the fact that you can lose that edge is what's going to make it feel feel more real. Because you really are getting the things, picking up the things in the way that I actually sees it, as opposed to defining every edge. So those lost edges, in a way, are really important if, uh, to create that sense of realism. Okay. Just work my way up until that value changes right here. And then there's mostly light around the edge of that eyebrow. Then I think I just want to come a little bit lower with that bottom edge of the eyebrow. So it's really fairly neutral color here there. I'm adding a little bit of green or orange to it. Okay, and just this edge here where the um, the edge of the nose is near the eye. I just have it over too far. I have to remember that this is all needs to line up. The top of the nose, the bridge of the nose, and the nostrils. Even though I'm just painting from shape to shape, and I'm probably not being careful enough of where those alignments are, I have to go back at the end and make sure that they are aligned or else those larger forms aren't going to read properly. Okay, let's see. Overall, knock back some of that value here. And have not, um, along the edge of the side of the face, I'm not really going dark enough yet to really get that form to turn. And then there's a little bit of hair that's over it. 
it's it's creating a little bit of interest. <clears throat> Let's, but I obviously I've made that way too strong. Let's see if I can get some light green around that to knock it back. Okay, I've got way too much going on there. Then I have to adjust the edge here. And, oh, I have a lot of things to do still with my um, seven minutes. So this is what I've usually done is I've gotten fairly close to a finish, which I would say that's where I am right now. But there's some little subtleties here and there that I really want to work on. And so I'm going to do those things offline. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot of value in you watching me do those little tiny adjustments that you probably can't even see on the camera. But just to know that I'm going to spend another 40 minutes or so doing that as part of getting the painting um feeling the way I want. And that's actually, it's where some of the magic happens, but um, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's that really quiet, slowing down and making a bunch of minor adjustments all over the painting to get some of that to happen. You just have to trust me that, um, that that's what I'm doing and that um, it just in the end will show it. So, so to give you an example, there's a little thing like the shape of the shadow on her mouth. It's just a little bit violet. I have to take the time, make sure I'm getting just the right value and color. And that little shadow has a particular shape to it that follows the form of the lip. And unless I am very intentional about getting that shape and I'm getting the pink color right next to it, that that lip is never going to feel quite right. But it really does take a fair amount of time slowing down and really seeing it and getting, getting those pieces to work. So I will keep on working again. Um, Thank you all that have um, tuned in to this and have joined me and um, are hanging out with me. Hopefully some of you, any little tips. Um, some of the things I'm talking about doesn't require that you're actually watching what I'm doing, but more just sort of general ideas. And hopefully those will be how different painting ideas as a time lapse is running. And, some, and usually those ideas relate to the painting that um, that's in the time lapse, and um, so those that kind of I have a bunch of those um, on my channel. They're they're sort of um, what's called getting a fair amount of um, continual views and visits, um, even though ones I've been months ago. And um, uh, nine thirty. Uh, sorry, 9.26, I'm going to go on for four more minutes, um, and then I'm going to call it a night, and then I'm going to do some, give my wife some help around the house, and then I'm going to maybe then go back and finish it, and um, just um, do some little bits here still while I have you here trying to suss out some of these um, these more delicate forms around the eyes and the cheek I really want to get some of the anatomy here that I'm still missing. It's not, again, it's not important that you paint every little thing in the face just as long as you're getting um, the overall feeling to read. It's really not that far off now. And I have the son that just came downstairs. He's looking kind of hungry, but that could be, and that happens all the time. Okay, just 
again. So, so it takes some time to get some of the these lighter colors to work um, because I have to get um, the purity of the color and just the right amount of white here to get the little specks of color that she has going on in her face and the subtleties too. Right here I'm barely seeing any transition of color and value so I'm just knocking this back quite a bit pulling out that white and not sure I'm having this cheek turn enough yet just a hint of that lower eyelid. When I say hint, it just changes almost more color than value. And I'm not quite getting it right. So that's like a light green that's just around that edge. Um, let's fix that this one brow here really does come down quite a bit um, sharper than I have it. And the same with the other side. Okay, so um, that's going to be it for tonight. Um, I'm just going to put my signature on it now. And uh, where do I want that? Just right in here. Okay, you can barely read that, but it's but it's in there. Okay, um, just one little final mark here. Going to go really hard with the highlight on the nose. It's a big, thick gob of paint. Trust me, this is the best way to finish. I've got quite a bit of paint there. Okay, I think... Um, like the one in the eye. Wow. <laughs> really went really went for it there. Um okay, you know have to adjust that a little bit offline, but um that's not too far off. Okay. So that's it for tonight. Thank you all for coming and joining in. I see there's three of you left and, and a few thumbs up. Thank you and, uh, and have a good night.